Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. A uh, pleasure to be back at Boston Children's. It's been a while since I was there on a daily basis. Uh, Ken was just asking me how often I'm uh, on site, and it's almost never. Although I do have a, a dinner coming up with Fred Alt and Gary Fleischer soon, so I kind of call that children's work. Uh, anyhow, I was uh, I was with you uh, there for ten years. I retired from my lab in uh, I think 2018, uh, and thought I was retiring, but I'm I've been told by my colleagues repeatedly that I'm not very good at that. Uh, there's I can't say no to great science and and other ventures, so. Uh, many, many balls in the air, uh, but it's all fun. Uh, but today I thought I'd tell you about uh, some older stories. Uh, three, I believe, are in this uh, deck that uh, was projects that we were working on in the lab that eventually led to some discoveries that got spun out into uh, various biotech companies and are either in clinical development or uh, emergency approved products. So uh, the first story starts uh, in this unlikely place or with this unlikely individual. I'm gonna to try to get a laser going here. Here we go, that's that. So Shin Yamanaka, as many of you know, made this really breathtaking uh, discovery in uh, 2006 where he could ectopically express but four transcription factors from the 24 that he tested to convert any differentiated cell type back to a pluripotent uh, embryonic stem cell-like state, uh, which he termed induced pluripotent stem cells. So the factors he found that could do this amazing feat were are, are in black here. And this is what sort of spurred uh, the first story that I'm gonna tell you about. So this was published in 2006. I started my lab at, at what was then the Immune Disease Institute before we merged with Boston Children's. Uh, but I started my lab in uh, 2007, and uh, uh, our lab and the entire field really were thinking, working on <laughs> Yamanaka's great discovery to try to propel it uh, towards the clinic. And one of the, one of the sort of uh, key, uh, I, I would say, obstacles standing in the way was that Yamanaka, when he had done his original uh, reprogramming experiments, had used integrating uh, retroviruses with these you know, proto-oncogenes uh, inserting into genomes. So many labs were trying to come up with um, other strategies for deriving these IP cells, which would be potentially more clinically translatable. So that's where we came in. And we had a very simple idea, trained as a molecular biologist. And I know that DNA makes mRNA, makes protein, makes life. And Yamanaka had used an RNA virus that got in, integrated in the DNA, but ultimately what we needed was, you know, ectopic expression of these four, which are now known as Yamanaka factors. So we had the very simple, you know, you know, re remedial idea of let's just cut out the DNA and let's just use mRNA outright. People were using uh, membrane uh, trans um, um, uh, proteins that pe uh, penetrate the cell wall to get in that worked, but it was very uh, ineffective. So we began this project in 2000, late 2007, early 2008, led by a fellow in my lab, Luigi Warren. And so we made, we were not mRNA scientists, uh, but knew enough about molecular biology that we could uh, uh, put together pretty good looking uh, mRNAs with, you know, five prime caps and uh, UTRs, three prime UTRs, poly eight, Tail open reading frame. Uh, and when we put it into cells, it absolutely didn't work. Uh, and it didn't work in spectacular fashion. You know, instead of getting any type of transformation or even ectopic expression of the proteins that we wish to be expressing, we were pretty much killing all the cells in the dish. And it sort of, you know, makes you, it's perhaps not a surprise you know, mRNA had been the inter obligate intermediate between DNA and protein synthesis that had been known since uh, 1961. And molecular biologists were using lots of DNA and they were using lots of protein, but nobody was using mRNA for ectopic expression of anything. Although I'm sure many labs tried and met the same fate that we did, 
when we did it, which was kill all their cells in the dish, which was, of course, not the plan. So that could have been the end of the story. Oh, and by the way, this is this very busy slide is why we were killing all the cells in the dish. So when we were, this is yet this is a um, diagram. This is the outside of the cell here, the upper part of the uh, slide, and uh, the nucleus down here. Uh, and so when it, we were trying to introduce RNA from the outside of the cell in, which is not, of course, normally where it comes from, mRNA. It's synthesized in the nucleus and exported to the cytoplasm to the ribosome for protein synthesis. But we were bringing it in from the outside. And just like other nucleic acids that come in through the, from the outside of the cell into the cell, the cell detects that as foreign. Uh, and in fact, if you're injecting any type of nucleic acid into cells, the cells think this is a, you know, some sort of nucleic acid from a pathogen. And so ever since cells and pathogens first met one another, uh, pathogens have been trying to come up with cool and inventive ways to get into cells undetected and cells have evolved these really exquisite pathways to detect this, you know, through TLRs and uh, MDA and uh, other pathways, ultimately converge on an NF-kappa B signaling pathway, which would lead to shutting down a protein synthesis and ultimately cell death if, if robust enough. And it's a good response for cells to have when nucleic acid is coming in from the outside. So this is this is why we were killing the cells. And I, like, as I said, that could have been the end of the story, but lucky for us, uh, there had been a publication uh, a couple of years prior to our, our work that, that helped us. So as it turns out, nucleosides, RNA nucleosides in vivo are heavily modified. Who knew? Uh, well, people studying this, I guess, knew, but I didn't know before we started this project. So there's actually over 110 different uh, modified nucleoside variants. For example, uridine can, can exist uh, in the cell as pseudouridine. Uh, and as I said, there's over 100 uh, different modified nucleosides. And the really critical paper was published in 2005 in uh, Immunity by two re researchers at UPenn, Kathleen Carrico and Drew Weissman. And they were they had discovered that certain of these modified nucleosides, it, when incorporated either on a short oligo of RNA or a longer uh, RNA molecule, they could evade these antiviral pathways and they could slip these oligos or these non-coding RNAs into the cell without tripping these antiviral pathways. They did not. So the paper was published in Immunity. In 2005, they didn't express anything. They didn't express. They didn't apply it to mRNA at all. Uh, although, of course, they had the idea because they're smart. But actually, the paper went largely, you know, sort of seen as yeah, it's a good journal, immunity, and and you know, it was nicely defined. They defined the pathways TLR that was tripping this antiviral response in response to the unmodified nucleosides. But other than that, the paper sort of disappeared. Uh, but lucky for us, it had been published. We dug it up and we thought, well, why don't we apply these modified nucleosides into our mRNA that we synthesized and see if we can now get that in to the cell without tripping these uh, antiviral uh, pathways. So I show you some very early data uh, that Luigi generated. So he synthesized, you know, test, test uh, transcript GFP with no modified nucleosides, just textbook unmodified nucleosides. And you could get a I hope you can see this on your screen. It's very low mag. These green dots here, they're, they're cells. You get a few green cells there. But if you look over on the right, uh, at particularly this, uh, this graph on, on the lower right, you can see that the viability of uh, cells transfected with that is very poor. So 20% 20, 20 of the cells survive. And that's upon one transfection. If you transfect them a second time, you literally clear every cell off the plate. <clears throat> In contrast, however, when we uh, synthesized um, mRNA, uh, GFP mRNA with 5-methylcytidine in place of cytidine, now you can see that there's a lot of green uh, cells in the dish. Viability was much improved. The mean fluorescence was, it was brighter. Uh, uh, the, the, the green dots were brighter the green cells of the, the expression of uh, the GFP transcript. Similarly, when we uh, synthesized mRNA now with pseudouridine in place of uridine, again, good viability. 
good uh, protein expression. And of course, these were on different nucleosides, so we could combine them. Uh, and that was really the, the key for us. You can see that the cells are very, very bright. So they have a very high mean fluorescent activity. You can see that there's lots of cells on the dish. The viability was uh, upwards of uh, above 80% in these experiments. And um, yeah, I mean, there's even some, some attrition from the vehicle here. So very close to having uh, no loss of viability. So we started to uh, you utilized, which we called mod RNA, modified mRNA, uh, and it had some great properties. For example, it was dose titratable. So here is just a, a fax uh, a plot or fax plots with increasing uh, 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 quantities of modified mRNA for GFP. And you could see that the more you put in, you've got more cells transfected and the, the protein expression would be higher, a higher mean fluorescence. Um, achieved, which you can see in this graph here. But there's one thing that's that was certainly clear is that when you expressed uh, a protein via modified mRNA, it would be a transient expression. Unlike DNA, which is a stable molecule, once transfected, it could go on and and uh, express for you know months or or even years. Uh, the mRNA is labile, so here's a time course. You you transfect a, a a green fluorescent protein transcript, you get peak expression at around 12, 15 hours, and by 90 hours, uh, the expression is gone. Uh, but we found that with the inclusion of these modified nucleosides that we could repeat transfect. So we could transfect every day. This experiment we transfect every day. This is just a bright field overlaid with the um, uh, the green channel. So you could see that we did we actually used a nuclear GFP here. So you could see that, 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 you know, A, there's a plate full of cells. So they're very happy to be transfected every day. They're certainly not uh, dying about it. Uh, and the cells are expressing GFP. Uh, another great property, you could combine multiple mRNAs at the same time and get them co-expressed. So this is just a very early experiment where we made a modified mRNA for a cherry or one for GFP and transfected into uh, human, uh, I think these were uh, fibroblasts, can't remember which cells these are, but you can see that all these, the uh, uh, cells co-express both of these uh, transcripts or turn them into proteins. So we actually turned back to the study that we're working on, which was moving cell fate around at Ala Yamanaka. So the first experiment we did was a, a simple one, a simple one-factor cell fate conversion. We turned back to the literature and found that MyoD, a sort of master myogenic transcription factor when ectopically expressed in fibroblasts could turn them into multinucleate contractile uh, muscle cells, which is what we achieved using a MyoD modified mRNA. We, of course, turned back to uh, pluripotency reprogramming a la Yamanaka and we're delighted to find that not only so this is an experiment this this is the Yamanaka experiment here where he's using well, it's retroviruses <clears throat> with the four factors and each of those these are plates uh, photographed from above so each of these um, uh, dots is stained with the pluripotency markers so these are pluripotent colonies when we did this with a uh, modified mRNA, we essentially got the entire plate converted into uh, pluripotent uh, colonies. So the efficacy was orders of magnitude above what it had been for Yamanaka's viral experiments. And then we did a cool experiment, I thought, that got very little attention. But, uh, you know, if we, you know the, the promise of iPS cells is that we're going to be able to use them to turn them into uh, clinically useful cell types to either use in drug screening in the near term or potentially um, autologous transplant in the longer term. So we first turned fibroblasts into iPS cells, and then we, again, used the technology once they were iPS cells to turn them into yet another uh, uh, cell fate. And we turn them into, again, using MyoD into multinucleate myofibers. So showing that this one uh, sort of technology could be used to really engineer cell fate from start to uh, finish via a, a pluripotent intermediate. So 
we published our study in uh, late 2007, no, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 2010, <laughs> just looking at the, uh, I'm terrible with the passage of time. We got, we got the cover of uh, Cell Stem Cell. It made a big uh, splash in uh, stem cell science, got a lot of uh, great coverage, uh, both in the lay and academic press. But actually, it was a little bit odd. Um, you know, I started to get calls from pharma executives saying, hey, we saw your technology for making IPS cells. We really love that, I, you know, because all of pharma was getting into IPS cells at the time. And they were all calling to license this IPS technology. But I found it a little bit odd that not one of them sort of stepped back to say, wait a minute, they can express proteins with this technology, which is what I was thinking about using this technology now to express any therapeutic protein that one may wish. Um, we know there's 6,000 genetic diseases, not including cancer. So, you know, patient has a mutation in their DNA, makes a bad copy of mRNA, makes a bad protein, gives disease one through 6,000. And like I said, not including cancer. So I thought, well, what if we could maybe now use this modified mRNA as a therapeutic? Of course, we had done all our work in cells in a dish. So what did we need to do to convince ourselves that this could be used in vivo uh, as a potential uh, genetic therapy, uh, if you will? So we did this experiment uh, in uh, late 2010. It was the work of Wataro Bina, an MD, PhD student in the lab, and Lior Zangi, who was a, a postdoc. And uh, they made uh, modified mRNA encoding luciferase. Um, you know, the protein that the fireflies use to flash uh, light uh, in the uh, uh, forest in the autumn. And we took it down to the animal colony, injected this modified mRNA for luciferase into mice that had been given the substrate luciferin. <clears throat> and then we just put them into these dark CCD chambers and photographed them. And we could see that <clears throat> really upon the first experiment, we could get modified mRNA to go into the thigh muscle of the mice into the ribosome, make the luciferase protein to get effective, uh, a functional luciferase protein to uh, act on its substrate and emit light. Um, and this is a uh, time course on the y-axis. So again, a short, a relatively short half-life of this. This is only taken out to 72 hours, but you could, we took it out farther in other experiments up to, you know, 100, 100 odd hours and protein expression be uh, gone by then, reflecting both the half-life of the protein and the mRNA, of course. <clears throat> and uh, on the y, um, sorry, the x-axis is uh, uh, dose. So it's dose titratable again, which is nice. So that is, uh, luciferase is not a therapeutic protein. So we did another experiment with actually a therapeutic protein. And this is the work of Pankaj Mandel and Marg Stewart, postdocs in lab. We made a human um, a modified mRNA for human erythropoietin. And the reason we did that was because we know that human erythropoietin acts on the mouse EPO receptor to stimulate red cell production, but it had an epitope difference that we could use uh, in ELISA. So we, um, uh, and detect a human from a mouse expression. So again, a dose tractable way, we could see we're expressing human EPO uh, into the mice. And this was again, in, uh, injected intramuscularly. And this led to a dose dependent increase in red cells, hematocrit, hem hemoglobin. So we could make a human protein, a functional human protein in mice and, and get, get it to get it to work. So, um, one final experiment, which took a little longer over the course of a few years, I think we, yeah, we published it in 2013, was uh, Lior in the lab had a um, interest in, um, uh, you know, the heart and uh, cardiomyocytes. So we took modified mRNA to the heart and found out that in contrast to dose-dependent DNA injection, this is the experiment here is a modified mRNA or DNA encoding the Cree recombinase, and this is putting in, it into mice that are lock stop locks, Lexi. So, in the presence of the Cree protein, the locks, um, uh, the Cree flips out the uh, or floxes out the uh, the stop codon to get expression of Lexi, which will stain blue. 
And you can see in the dose dependent way of the modified mRNA, even with a single injection into the heart that you got a really robust swathe of the, the mouse heart expressing uh, lax -E, which was, and not just along the needle track, which was really cool. You can see that here, here's a cross section. So we did the same, this was questions from the reviewer to show it in contrast to DNA. So DNA was not very good at doing this, but you could see I think the needle track was here and you get really this large swathe of the heart uh, expressing the uh, modified mRNA for Cre, leading to, you know, floxing out this stop codon to get Laxe expressed. And we applied it uh, then, <clears throat> again, Lior and uh, Wataro's idea to express VGF, vascular endothelial growth factor uh, in a, a heart ligation model. So you tie off the heart, you give the animals a infarction, and then you can just untie them and they'll recover poorly and they'll have a um, fibrotic uh, uh, recovery with uh, poor vasculogenesis. But when we ectopically expressed a modified mRNA for VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, you can see that we actually got really robust uh, uh, neo-vessel formation, which led to a uh, much better um, uh, uh, recovery from this uh, um, experimental infarct that we had induced. And again, better better so than DNA. So this was published in 20, uh, 2013 in Nature Biotech. Actually, AstraZeneca ends up in, license, in licensing this technology, not from Children's, which is, by the way, where it should have come from because that's where it was invented, but from Moderna, um, and uh, took it into phase two. But I, they've just recently discontinued that program. <clears throat> Very high bar program, to be honest. <clears throat> so um, the original pitch when I went to, out to sort of um, raise money thinking about starting Moderna was that the properties of modified mRNA were, were quite good. It was non-toxic. These were naturally occurring nucleosides, non-immunogenic. That's what makes it work. Dose titratable. That's good for a drug. Temporal control of protein expression, either transient, a one-off or repeated dosing. And really the key thing was versatility. Any protein for which you knew the mRNA sequence, which is essentially all proteins, could be turned into a modified uh, RNA for expression. The timeline for drug development, boy, boy, have we ever seen this in action with, uh, with COVID. I envisioned, you know, um, in uh, 2010 would be very quick because you could make an mRNA very quickly, synthesize it very quickly. When we had a new idea to make a new mRNA in the lab, it would take us about a week to make a completely new mRNA, purified at lab level, not at you know level to go into people. And you could test the therapeutic efficacy quite quickly. And you know we've, we saw this play out in real time in the clinic with uh, the um, modified mRNA for the first uh, spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, <clears throat> and that this would disrupt existing protein uh, therapeutic paradigms or could. So there's 110 different FDA approved proteins, but now instead of making proteins in large factories, which is pretty uh, uh, cost ineffective, uh, you could actually make the um, nucleic acid, the modified mRNA, and have the patient produce their own uh, proteins, <clears throat> thinking that it would be properly post-translationally, <clears throat> excuse me, modified. Excuse me one sec. Uh, something, you know, you could, you could make proteins that are either secreted, and I called this a depot strategy, so put it in the, you know, the intramuscular injection, but have it be a secreted protein that could work anywhere, like EPO. Um, and I don't mean to suggest that EPO is a good drug, although the cyclists would, might argue otherwise, but, but it was just a demonstration of that principle. Or you could, and this is contrast to uh, protein therapeutics, you could use, you could uh, have the cell express um, intracellular proteins or even intranuclear proteins, which is something that traditional protein therapeutics are not good at. And I imagine that the cost of goods would be favorable to protein manufacturing at some point. So with that, I went and founded Moderna with a couple of co-founders, Bob Langer at MIT, who had not, never worked on mRNA, but had experience in starting biotechs and was a delivery expert. And that's why I asked Bob to to co-found with me and Ken Chen, who was a clinician. Bob's an engineer, I have a PhD. I wanted a clinician on the team, so we got Ken involved. 
and we raised very modest uh, $2.5 million in 2010, the original sites over in Cambridge. And then, you know, just some facts about Moderna. It's kind of a, I guess, a household word now. And you can, you know, even, even in uh, Fenway Park, there's a big Moderna sort of uh, um, um, a bumper on the, you know, so that the outfielders don't run into a brick wall when they're trying to catch a ball. So we raised uh, originally uh, $2.5 million in 2010, went up to, while being public, public over $2.5 billion. That's both in investment and partnerships. Went public in uh, 2018, uh, raised a record amount of money, uh, over $600 million at the time, had a great ticker, mRNA. <clears throat> and this is an old number. I'm not sure what the market cap is today. Uh, probably, I actually have no idea what it is today. Um, I think there's close to 300, this, I'm sorry, this is an old slide, close to 3,000 uh, employees. This was important before Moderna had a product. They built a 2,000 square foot GMP manufacturing facility in Norwood, 20 minutes that way. Uh, and again, this is old. I think there are more programs uh, in the portfolio now uh, and more that have entered the clinic. Uh, and they've, you know, there's all kinds of therapeutic areas and development, prophylactic vaccines, cancer vaccines, secreted proteins, intracellular proteins, um, intratumoral immuno-oncology, lots of very exciting things. <clears throat> and again, this is old, but it's a snapshot of what the pipeline looked like whenever I took this shot. So you could see that, you know, cancer vaccines phase two and phase one. Uh, you know, various phases of various different programs. Uh, and of course, the one that everybody heard about that made it through to um, FDA emergency approval was the vaccine for, <clears throat> excuse me, COVID-19. CMV is a fo uh, fast follow. It's in phase three right now. Uh, influenza, certainly the, the, the um, uh, vaccine, the prophylactic vaccine uh, arm has really exploded because of COVID, but I, I would be most excited about what, what uh, modified mRNA can do in the uh, oncology space. And that's where I think it's going to make a really uh, big impact. So uh, this data, you've all seen your clinicians. This is for a talk, uh, or some of your clinicians, I guess. Uh, but you, you're scientists, you've seen this. This is just a more general talk, but this was the data that that was published uh, in uh, the New England Journal in uh, December of 2020 uh, for the mRNA-1273 mo modified mRNA uh, a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so, you know, uh, first dose here, second dose here. This is time on the x-axis. Uh, and this was at a time of raging pandemic as if we've really gotten out of that phase. I guess we're raging endemic right now. And the cumulative event rate on the uh, y-axis, so the placebo group in the in gray and the uh, those that got the vaccine in, <clears throat> in blue, and the data was unequivocal. Those that got the vaccine ceased to get uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2. 100% uh, uh, protection against hospitalization and death whereas those that got placebo continued to be infected, but the virus <clears throat> would get hospitalized. And, and even we had one uh, person die in the placebo group uh, in this trial. It was a large trial, 30,000 patients. Interestingly, Pfizer and BioNTech published their data on modified mRNA against uh, uh, the, the spike protein uh, antigen, and the, the data was almost identical, 94% efficacy against uh, infection. So it was really satisfying for this new technology to be developed by two completely separate entities taken into very large uh, cohorts and have it work at comparable um, efficiency. So that was then. Uh, and again, I, I make this slide just for a general audience. Apologies. So the effectiveness against uh, the original strain was 94%. You may all... <laughs> Delta is a long time ago now, but the efficacy against Delta was, you know, 70 to 80 percent, uh, 94 percent have boosted. But Omicron, of course, has evolved so much that the original vaccines which are against the spike protein and Omicron has got many mutations in the spike pr pr protein. It's really only 20 to 40 percent effective against infection. You can increase that uh, when, when boosted. And like I said, Omicron, you know, 54 mutations in Omicron, 
Lucky for us, it's less likely to cause severe disease than previous variants of concern. But uh, the good news is that both Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech um, bivalent boosters have been um, FDA emergency authorized at the end of August. So you now get an Omicron plus the original strain booster, and they're at your local pharmacy now, I guess. And you're all scientists. I think we can all be certain that you know, we're going through the Greek alphabet, alphabet here at, at Omicron. We're halfway through the alphabet. You know, phi, rho, sigma, all the way to omega are, are likely to emerge. So we need to stay vigilant. So I'm uh, going to tell you about a different story now um, that we worked on uh, in the lab. So this is towards improving the first stem cell therapy. So this is a, uh, a diagram that many of you have seen. I didn't make it. So, and as most of you know, hematopoietic stem cells, uh, HSCs are the functional units of bone marrow transplant procedures. And this is the number of bone marrow transplants that were done. I think this is from 20, uh, uh, 2013 or 2015. I can't remember which. But, um, you know, there's about 50,000 uh, transplants performed each year globally. And that's for like a number of uh, conditions, leukemia and lymphomas, uh, primarily myeloma, can be used for plastic anemia, bone marrow failure syndromes. Um, and there has been proof of concept for many other um, illnesses, including autoimmune disease. But it remains, I'm sorry, you can't really see this. I'm back was probably supposed to fade out. So uh, sorry about that. Something happened to my slide. It nonetheless, even though it's it's really uh, curative for many diseases, it remains the sort of last choice that patients have because it's a high risk procedure. Uh, high risk procedure, the HLA or, or the one year survival rates for HLA matched siblings is only seventy percent. For unrelated donors, it's it's less than you know around fifty five percent. So uh, we could do better. Moreover, uh, patients that get um, uh, transplanted often relapse, depending upon what they're being transplanted for. They get opportunistic infection. They get graft-versus-host disease. If they get um, allogeneic transplants as opposed to autotransplants. So much could be done to improve this. But this is, you know, a very successful uh, procedure that's been in the clinic for, you know, over 60 years. Um, over a million patients have been uh, transplanted. Uh, I love this picture. This is um, uh, the oldest uh, surviving bone marrow transplant recipient. And this is now an old photo, but uh, this is um, Nancy McLean here. This is her transplant doc, uh, Robert Kyle here on the left. And actually, I think maybe the most important person here is only sort of half uh, seen in this photo, but it's this uh, woman here who, if you look closely, clearly looks like uh, Nancy McLean. It's her twin sister, and that was her donor. So in, it, in the early stages of uh, uh, transplantation, before we knew about HLA typing, you could really only have a successful transplant between twins. But thank goodness uh, uh, we uh, learned more, such that you can have an image like we have on the bottom, where this girl on the left, this 13-year-old Jocelyn Miller, uh, is uh, here uh, seen with her uh, bone marrow donor, Petra Poker, uh, which uh, cured Jocelyn of very severe sickle cell disease. But, uh, you know, there's lots of problems with bone marrow transplantation, significant toxicities, infection, mucositis, relapse, graft-versus-host disease. It's really, like I said, a last resort for many patients. You're you, you, you probably get treated with any every other thing before finally your last option is bone marrow transplant. So we were thinking about this along with colleagues, many actually at the at, in the children's uh, and and uh, uh, children's hospital community. So we imagine so here's the normal paradigm, you know, a donor uh, donates bone marrow stem cells, they're processed, they're cryopreserved. The patient gets you know high dose chemo or some type of uh, conditioning regimen and the cells were reinfused into that patient. So we imagine that you could potentially intervene in several places to better mobilization of better stem cells. Some patients or some people are not good donors or not good mobilizers. 
certainly the one thing is true that the more stem cells transplanted, that's the single biggest um, uh, factor for transplant outcome, the more the better. But stem cells are resistant to expansion. You try to expand them ex vivo and they quickly differentiate. And conditioning uh, is, is, a, is clearly something that needs to be worked on as well uh, to make uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant uh, safer and, and potentially, you know, enable it for as a curative therapy, both for standard of care settings, but also, you know, um, uh, clinical settings for which uh, there's been uh, a, a shown promise, like autoimmune disease. So we um, worked on both the stem cell um, expansion aspect and developed a real nice technology for that, which actually got out licensed to a company called Selexis. We had a, um, a long a science meeting today for the company, and the data looks really outstanding with that expansion technology. But we also worked on something in collaboration with um, uh, Raul Paterji and uh, David Skadden at, at, um, uh, then at Harvard slash MGH uh, for um, uh, a targeted monoclonal antibody immunotoxin approach targeting stem cells with this um, uh, toxin conjugated antibody to just clear the stem cell compartment to get uh, to condition the patients. In this case, it was mice for transplant. So, for example, we went after um, C kit. This was done the work of uh, Nishka Chekowitz in my lab. So um, uh, CKIT, which is uh, CD117, is relatively um, limited in expression to uh, hematopoietic stem cells and their uh, proximal multipotent and oligopotent progenitors. It's also expressed in other cell types around the body. But in the blood system, you can pretty much hit stem cells and their progenitors with CKIT. So we uh, hooked that up to an immunotoxin uh, condition the mice with that. If you don't condition the mice and then transplant in uh, uh, cells, you get very limited chimerism, chimerism on the y-axis here. Whereas if you condition with the <clears throat> antibody, you could get, you know, really robust, you know, 90% chimerism. So this got uh, spun into a company called Magenta Therapeutics, which is uh, in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, the original uh, David Skadden uh, uh, founded it with a, a original team here on the right. And this is uh, an old slides, apologies, uh, went public in 2018, raised $100 million, Magenta is a ticket, and again, who knows what the market cap is nowadays, but these are the clinical programs that they're running, either for the mobilization, recall I said potentially we could mobilize better, the conditioning uh, uh, aspect, which was a bit of the data that I just showed you about, of which I'm really excited by, because I think this would be really <clears throat> trans uh, transformative for patients. And... Uh, 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 other uh, other programs. So uh, one final story, uh, and sorry to rush through all these and do do it at a very high level. Uh, but it starts actually from from uh, this patient, who many will recognize as the Berlin patient, Timothy Brown, uh, and he was uh, twice very unlucky and once super lucky. So he was unlucky in that he was um, um, HIV positive. That's unlucky. But then he got really unlucky in that he developed acute myeloid leukemia. But luckily for him, uh, he uh, came at a time where it had already been discovered that um, certain, there's a receptor called CCR5, and there's mutations in CCR5, naturally occurring mutations that occur in people that would make them highly resistant to HIV-1 infection. So it's called the Delta-32 mutation. If you're Delta-32, Delta-32 homozygote, it seemed to have no impact on your, your blood biology, but it made you uh, highly resistant to um, HIV infection. And CCR5, by the way, is a co-receptor of how HIV gets into the cell for infection, to initiate infection. So we started working on this really as soon as CRISPR uh, made the jump uh, from uh, the, the prokaryotic system, uh, you know, uh, bacteria defending against uh, bacteriophage uh, and made the jump into uh, sort of editable 
uh, um, uh, gene editing system. So we started this work in uh, January of 2013, really almost the moment these papers from Feng Zhang and George Church and uh, Chopinier and Doudna were published. And we, it was a simple idea, use CRISPR-Cas9 to make a Delta-32 allele in human hematopoietic stem cells. And this would be CCR negative or CCR, you know, Delta-32. And then potentially use these for transplant down the road. So we started working on this again with Pankaj Mandal uh, in my lab, published a paper in um, cell stem cell in 2014. Uh, and the data was pretty impressive. It was the first time CRISPR had been taken into human hematopoietic stem cells, which almost surely be the first sort of clinical uh, cell type that, well, let's, let's see, CRISPR is in the liver, it's in blood, it's in the eye. Let's see what gets first. But certainly blood is a, an obvious candidate because blood you can take out, you can manipulate it, you can CRISPR it and put it back in and blood still works, still does what it does particularly HSCs. So we did a dual guide strategy to make a deletion, tested a number of guides and a bunch of different human donors. And, and you can actually assay HSCs clonally. So, you know, looked at a lot of different clones here to find out with various guide combinations that we could either hit one allele pretty effectively or both alleles pretty effectively. It's like, you know, 20 to 25% both alleles uh, knocked out. Those cells were still functional. We could transplant them into uh, immunocompromised mice and get a human graft. Uh, when you analyze the graft, it was giving rise to T cells, B cells, and myeloid cells. Uh, and then we did a you know a southern blot to see that the you know the delta allele that we had created was had been grafted into these animals. So the idea is, would be simple, and there's lots of data in this paper which I don't show you. Uh, but the idea is simple. You take an HI, uh, HSCs out of HIV patient, you CRISPR them, you target CCR5, you make a delta allele. Potentially, if you've got um, <clears throat> um, a nice conditioning regimen, alimagenta, you could transplant back into those patients and pot potentially uh, rid them of their uh, uh, of, of being HIV positive. Um, interestingly, and this is kind of cool, Cas9 in almost all the companies is being expressed with modified RNA. Comes full circle back to the to the original um, story that I told you about. Uh, it's it, modified mRNA is perfect for expressing Cas9. It's remember I showed you the data. It's transient. You get expression for you know peak expression, a lot of expression for a short period of time, and then it goes away. This is exactly what you want with a genome editor. You want it expressed, and then you want it to go away. So sure enough, all the CRISPR companies are using modified mRNA to express their Cas9. So that's kind of cool. We also got the cover uh, of uh, cell stem cell for uh, when we published this paper in 2014. Uh, we. So that paper was published something like a week and a half later. We uh, announced the founding of um, Intellia Therapeutics with some great CRISPR uh, pioneers, Jennifer Doudna, of course, you know, Rudolf Barangu, uh, Luciana Marafini, Eric Sondheimer, myself and others. This is, again, an old picture. The company went public in 2016. Uh, tickers, uh, NCLA have no idea about the market cap now, uh, and these are some of the programs. So they're doing both in vivo um, um, editing, so in you know modified mRNA for Cas9 with a guide into a lipid nanoparticle targeting the liver, uh, and these programs are actually showing really great progress. <clears throat> some clinical data was uh, presented last week, but also ex vivo, <clears throat> where you take cells out, typically blood cells. Uh, much as we had done in our study, CRISPR them and then transplant them back into patients, and that's making good progress as well. So I'm going to stop there and take questions. Uh, so many people to acknowledge. Uh, this is the team that I had when I was at uh, Children's. Uh, we were in, um, in the Warren Alpert building, uh, and many collaborators and funding sources. And I'm going to stop there and, and take questions if you have them. Thank you. And hopefully somebody can moderate the questions because I'm not looking at the chat box. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Derek. That was uh, spectacular.
if you uh, you can stop sharing your screen. Yeah, so there we go. Questions. And um, let me um, uh, kick this off uh, with a question uh, for you. Um, so you talked about um, coming across the Weissman and Carrico papers uh, and that inspired you. Um, it wasn't a hugely publicized advance the way CRISPR is um, as, as you're working now with Davna and others. But this is a, an amazing example of a handoff between labs um, that happened because you were attentive and receptive to it. Um, can you talk a little more about just the happenstance uh, of coming across that paper, What, how you were prepared to read it and think about it and apply it, your state of mind at the time, because that was really a key moment in this story. Yeah, it's true. And I wonder how many other, you know, gems and enabling gems are out there in the literature that have just been sort sort of overlooked. And, you know, there might be still somebody trying to work on it and, and raise the money for it. I mean, quite frankly, uh, Catalin and Drew uh, thought their phones were going to be ringing off the hook. Uh, they've become friends. Uh, and they said it just didn't happen. They were shocked. Um, and they actually start, they founded a company, but they didn't, you know, the, you know, that they, they didn't uh, gather any investment. They got uh, some uh, cyber uh, NIH grant and they had a little offshoot. Their own UPenn did not even license their IP to them. UPenn licensed their IP to a reagents company, believe it or not. So it's it's an amazing it's amazing how this really what I think is going to be it's a Nobel Prize winning discovery. I think Drew and Kathy will get the Nobel Prize. I sure hope they do. They deserve it. It's so fundamental because, like I said, it's enabled it enabled us to meet the challenge on uh, SARS-CoV-2. I didn't mention, but you know, from the publication of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome to delivery of a clinical grade mRNA vaccine to the NIH took 42 days, 42 days to get a, a, a new vaccine from sequence, like from sequence to going into patients. That is just unprecedented. And it's the, it's the technology that allows that. I mean, anybody who knows they've done a PCR reaction knows that synthesizing nucleic acid is really easy. Um, so, um, at, at the time, uh, we were thinking that it was going to work with mRNA, but then of course, like I said, if you, you think, why hasn't anybody else been using mRNA? Well, maybe nobody came up with the idea. That's hard to believe in, in 50 or 60 years since mRNA. So it's, I guarantee you that little, literally thousands of labs have tried to use mRNA to express their protein of interest and just failed because it tripped these antiviral pathways. And they just said, well, we thought it would work, but, but we thought there might be a workaround. And so we went in literature and I, I give kudos to the postdoc who was a super technologist, a really, really great technologist. And he said, you know, we, we talked about what the problems was. We, we recognized that we were tripping antiviral pathways. We did some gene expression profiling and some PCR. We said, oh boy, we're really tripping the antiviral pathways here. And so that guided us on what type of literature we would be looking at. Uh, and when Drew and Kathy published their paper, it was largely in the setting of this, you know, antiviral response. And actually, it was a colleague at Children's that flagged that particular paper to us, said, hey, have you looked at this paper? And we said, no, we haven't, but thanks for the heads up. And we looked at the study and we said, this is worth a try uh, in mRNA. They hadn't used it in mRNA at the time. Uh, and, you know, again, a week later, we had an mRNA for GFP and put it into the cells. And now that instead of getting a plate full of dead cells, we got robust viability and GFP expression. So, yeah, like I said, I'll bet you there's a, there's probably hundreds of gems like that in literature that just didn't get the, uh, the attention that they deserve. Hopefully you would, you always think, you know, publish and at some point something really important is going to bubble up, you know, it's going to rise to the surface at some point. Uh, it did in this case. And yeah, lucky, luckily we had a hand in 
just you know discovering that and help, uh, helping it bu bubble up but really it doesn't happen without Kathy and Drew's uh, uh, seminal study great um let, let's stay at a high level for a couple questions here um here's one and I just I don't want to deprive this uh participant of getting a little advice any advice for faculty members who are interested in commercializing their discoveries um, and, uh, you know, I, staying in academia, but uh, moving into um, into licensing some of their their uh, inventions. Yeah, so I, you know, the best advice is talk to somebody who's seen the movie before. So somebody who's done that. Uh, this is the a term we used in Moderna is like you you want the reason you want somebody who's seen the movie before is because there's always a, a jump scare. And if you've seen the movie before, you know it's coming. If you haven't seen the movie before, you're like, oh my God, I wasn't expecting that, what to do? So there are so many biotech mentors in this town. So first and foremost, I would go and, and talk, <clears throat> excuse me, talk to somebody that's uh, uh, done that before. And that's what I did. I mean, the first person I uh, talked to, and I don't know if he's on the line here at all, Tim Springer, uh, who's at uh, still at Children's and um, uh, uh, the med school. But, you know, Tim had started a millennium and I went into his office in early uh, 2010 and walked him through my science deck. And he said, this is, you know, he challenged me on many things. We talked about vaccines literally on the first day. Uh, and um, because it was actually a company that was trying to make mRNA vaccines, CureVac in Germany, and they were already around, uh, but they were not using modified nucleosides. And, you know, they ended up running a trial for SARS-CoV-2, which didn't work. because They weren't using modified nucleosides. So they're now using modified nucleosides. But I told Tim, I said, well, that's not going to work because they're not using, modified, they're not going to get enough protein expression. They were using the idea of a non-modified mRNA to, as a sort of adjuvant, that it would stimulate this immune response. But I said, boy, boy, that's a tough balance, you know, getting the adjuvant activity, yet still getting enough protein expressed. What you got when, when you use modified nucleosides, you got tons of protein expressed. You can add in, in any old adjuvant you like after that, but at least you've got the antigen that you're, you're trying to raise, uh, uh, an immune response against what, you know, really robustly expressed. So anyhow, lo long way to say that, that uh, meant uh, talking to, and there are so many walking around uh, Harvard Med School, it's, it's very, and in your department, it's easy to find somebody who's, who's done it. And they may tell you, and I talk to people all the time, they may say, well, it's not right. You're not ready for prime time yet. You know, you still need to do this, that, the other. That's the type of advice you want. You know, find out where you are in the spectrum, and they or, and or they might say, "Hey, this is great. You should have launched this a year ago." I'll introduce you to some some other people, maybe VCs or somebody to help you raise money or think about it some more. Mentorship, great and helpful answer. Now going uh, uh, lower lower down in, into into the weeds a bit, uh, but important weeds. Um, from Felix uh, Dietlein, who's one of our junior faculty in, in cancer research informatics, tumor cells often lose expression of tumor uh, suppressor genes, which, are, which is not notoriously hard to target with small molecules because they're inhibitors. Curious about your thoughts on using messenger RNA expression to regain tumor suppressor, tumor suppressor expression in tumor cells. Absolutely. Well, go back to the, um, uh, um, you know, the map of all the things that cancer cells do to evade everything that we throw at them. And, you know, loss of tumor suppressors is one of them. Activation of oncogenes, another that's a more easy to approach with a with a small molecule. But you're exactly right. Um, uh, tumor uh, tumor suppressors are gone. So how do you get them expressed again? Well, they're proteins. You could do it with modified mRNA. So uh, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, immune evasion, you know, there's all, all, you know, the quote unquote hallmarks of cancer. There's almost, there almost isn't a hallmark of cancer from the, um, uh, what was it, Weinberg and uh, Hannah, Hannah, Hannah? And, and uh, there almost isn't a, a hallmark of cancer that can't be approached with protein, thinking about proteins. 
So I would argue that that you know almost every every aspect of cancer could be approached in some clever way or another. I really am am convinced that um, oncology is the next big thing for modified mRNA because you can express proteins, particular two tumors. You can you can you could you know if you if they're accessible with a syringe or some other delivery device. You can go right into the tumor and express a tumor suppressor, get all those local cells, or you can get them, you know, to express um, the, you know, surface proteins that are warding off the immune system or, 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 or down, you know, there's, there's a thousand possibilities. You know, the cool thing is that, um, so it's really your imagination is the only thing limiting the possibilities here. Um, the great thing is the global stage that the, uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech got was basically everybody and their brother now is starting an mRNA company, including all of major pharma. So I'm really happy about that because there are so many things that can be done. And now there's going to be so much research, uh, um, re a research and resource pumped into this, so many dollars. And it's really just a dollar and, and brain and body problem. But we're going to see, you know, it's funny. Uh, in 2010, I made a prediction. I said, oh, and I think in you know 10 years, we might have our first modified mRNA drug. Then in the five years after that, it'll go up to five. And then the 10 years after that, it'll go up to 25 and you know just go from there. And I, I still believe that to be the case. Actually, to get from 2010 to 2020 and get a FDA approved product is actually really fast for a new paradigm. Uh, mRNA therapeutics, but but it's uh, it's it's exploded since the and it did it simply because of the economics and the eff efficacy of how well it worked uh, in the global stage and how we were also impacted by the pandemic. I mean, it just like I said, it's a it's a mRNA is uh, and Moderna is a you know a, a kitchen table word that anybody can throw around now in you know mom pa in kansas you know on their farm you know moderna hey, what'd you get moderna or pfizer i mean everybody says that uh, i wish there was more education for mrna science and what it is because we could and you didn't ask about this but you know there's a lot of misinformation out there and that would have been easily warded off uh with you know proper education campaign instead of, instead of letting you know the internet who is a liar uh start to spread misinformation you know one thing i i point out to people is that mrna is not a foreign molecule uh estimates are that every cell in your body has about 300,000 copies of mrna in it and there's about 40 trillion cells in a human adult so 40 trillion times 300,000 is the copies of mRNA that we have in our bodies right now. So you want a functional a molecule of life, you got it. Right. Derek, I can't thank you enough. Um, I know you've got to run, so we'll end on time today at five and um, just extend my, ex my thanks for everyone on the Zoom today for an incredible uh, enlightenment from your uh, overwhelming success and much luck. Uh, we uh, wish you in these in your current set of endeavors as well. And I hope we'll uh, get to circle back with you. Super enjoyed. Thank you much. Uh, it takes a village, so and an army of scientists. So keep plugging. Thank you. Thanks all. And just to. Um, uh, Finish up. Uh, whoops. Just to finish up, we have upcoming uh, talks. Um, don't forget to tune in. Uh, coming up soon uh, in a couple of weeks is Mihaela Vandeshar on learning health systems, and then Nate Cooperman on research networks. Karen Copenhaver, uh, who is the Linux uh, attorney, uh, will talk to us about um, wise use of open source. Wanda Barfield, who directs reproductive health. Uh, and perinatal health at the CDC will talk to us about an extremely timely topic. Ray Kurzweil, inventor and futurist, Christina Farr, health tech investor, uh, investor and um, 
uh, very uh, accomplished and widely known CNBC health and tech reporter, Richard Miner, inventor of Android, Alan Brandt, um, an unbelievably uh, brilliant uh, professor of history at, uh, of medicine at uh, Harvard, Ron ba Balliser, who helped drive a lot of the uh, uh, vaccine real-world research uh, in Israel, uh, real-world evidence uh, research in Israel, leading to um, uh, a lot of information about messenger RNA vaccines and their safety and efficacy. Uh, and Robert Langer, uh, another uh, co-founder uh, of Moderna and uh, extraordinarily um, prolific uh, patenter of inventions. We will see you uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, wishing everybody um, a good start to the fall.